right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inspiring Hope. I'm your host, Lois Herman, and I'm here to share and celebrate information on people who are making a difference in our world. And today I have a very special mother who is dedicated, has dedicated her life to creating a nonprofit organization. So welcome, welcome, Mary Ann Bergman. Hi. Please tell us about yourself. Uh, so I, I live in Colorado um, and I have three children, two older boys, um, actually 24 and 22 this year. And then my daughter, Emma, who will be seven this year. So a little bit of a gap there. <laughs> um, and so I just um, take care of my daughter. She's autistic and nonverbal. And um, I am actually able to stay at home and take care of her. Um, in the state of Colorado, we have a lot of resources. It's actually the number one state for resources. Um, and so that I'm able to stay at home, take care of her and get her all of the, all of her needs met myself at home. So um, that's what I'm doing right now, along with creating the nonprofit. Wow. So tell us about the story, what happened with her and, and a little bit of the progression that you've had to learn in order to then decide to do the nonprofit. So what, what happened? Yeah. So um, I was, you know, approaching 40 when I had Emma. Um, it's definitely a lot different than when I was in my twenties and having children, like energy wise in your body, just the way, you know, sure. you respond to childbirth and, and having a small child. Uh, so I was approaching 40, um, and Emma was born, she was developing normally. Um, and then I was working full time. I'm a barber stylist. So I was managing, um, a high-end barbershop in the Denver area. Mm -hmm. And I was working full time and, and I just started to notice all of a sudden that, uh, Emma's development just sort of to slow. And then it's almost like it just halted. Um, it's very difficult as a parent. And I just, I said this last night to someone trying to describe it, but when you have a child and you look in your phone photos and in your reels, you just have videos because they're developing and you're recording everything. But with autism, it's almost like that stops because there's no new things to record. Um, so it was very, um, scary. I'm also pretty holistic in this, the mindset of children will develop in their own time. And I, I allow that yeah. space. And I did that with my boys as well. So, um, I'm not real big on, you know, uh, you know, cornerstones, like hitting certain things like other people are, but when it was stopping, um, she, she was speaking and then that stopped. Um, and so a lot of those things were starting to show up. So, Unfortunately, it was uh, in 2020, and so very difficult to get in to see specialists. Um, it takes about a year on the wait list to get diagnosed for autism, to start getting services. So I had to get creative and go to a couple different companies, and that was hard to figure out. And basically, it's a very, like Colorado offers all these services, but it's it was really hard for me to find. I probably spent two years full-time. Um, after 2020, just trying to get access and figure out what to do for her. Um, so it was very overwhelming um, and frustrating trying to get access to that. So um, once we finally got settled in and I'm a CNA, I was certified um, nursing assistant. So I take care of Emma um, and I'm able to get paid to take care of Emma according to her needs. So some children receive more hours and some children less. Emma's about in the middle in terms of hours. Um, the other beautiful part about it is I have a live-in um, respite provider who's my mom. So okay. my mom is actually paid to stay at home and help me with the care of my daughter. So a uh, game changer. You know, if, if I didn't know that these services existed, I'd be working full-time, probably not even making enough to survive in this economic climate and sending my daughter somewhere you know, where I'm not positive her needs are being met, um, because I'm not there. And so, uh, it was a lot of work. So basically I wanted to create a nonprofit and I wanted it to be, um, what I wish I would have found, you know, at the beginning of my process, right. there's so much information out there, but it's a lot to take in. And so our, um, focus is just the very beginning steps of, approaching the understanding that there's autism present and what could be available to your child. Um, and then the application process. So 
Um, I just, you know, it's pretty simple, but I think that that's exactly what we needed is something to simplify the process. And so I'm really excited about sharing it with people, getting out, um, you know, there's a lot of people, the spectrum, let's just say this, that the autism spectrum is so wide mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, your child can fall. They'll, they'll tell you, you know, your child's on the spectrum to a certain degree. Um, and so it's, it's really hard to, uh, I guess I'd say find a community because the wide range of um, symptoms and issues that children might have uh, when you are having a child and you know the child has Down syndrome, there's a community when the child's born. And if there's a medical issue, there's a community waiting for you um, when the child's born. But with autism and it being developmental and all of that, it's just, it's, it's so wide that, um, you know, I think that it, it, it falls into a different space. And so that's what we wanted to create. And that's what we've been working on for, I'd say at least eight months now, setting up the nonprofit. Luckily, my mom uh, is a grant writer. And so we just kind of melded together my vision of the website and then her ability to do grant writing. So, and you know, it is, it is very important that people know these types of resources exist I know as a single mother myself, I didn't realize that there were options that I had. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was always used to being the breadwinner, used to earning a living. And then when I ended up without um, another, my spouse and, and divorced, I had access that I could have tapped into. I eventually found out about getting New Hampshire Healthy Kids for my son, use of insurance, but it was way after years of struggling on my own. So it's important for people to realize that there are government or other type of social assistance available. So that's what your nonprofit is about. It's about helping people to navigate and find ways to get what they need in order to support themselves and their children. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and there are other states that offer this as well. And eventually I would love to see our model be picked up in other states um, where people can feature what that state provides for this. Colorado just happens to be number one. I mean, people move here to gain access to this. This is one of the, I mean, they, they move here for that from Texas and Florida and other places that don't have the same uh, type of resources. And so I think, you know, I've always been a resourceful person. I choose a single mom with my boys and working full time. And then, you know, with Emma, it was just 2020 and then Emma and everything, it was like hitting a brick wall. And um, it was hard. I hit it hard. <laughs> it was awful. But I think that, you know, redirected my purpose because it's almost like if you've gone through something, why wouldn't you turn around and tell other people and help them in the process? So that's sort of what this is, is it's sort of reaching back out. Um, it's, and, you know, really accepting a diagnosis of autism is very difficult for people to do. Um, I know I had my pre pre notions or notions about autism and ADHD um, as a barber, every child pretty much that came in and got a haircut, the parent would say that they have autism. And I noticed that more and more frequently. And I thought not every child has autism. And then, you know, when I had Emma and it was abundantly clear that she does as, you know, she's nonverbal, so she doesn't speak. Um, and she's almost seven and I've never heard her talk is, you know, that, that there are a lot of children that fall into this arena. Um, and there's so many great services and really amazing people that work within this space mm -hmm. that really want to help. And so gaining access to that, I mean, it just changed everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm no longer working for, you know, the man I'll say, but I'm like, you know, burning behind a chair as a barber stylist. It's dependent upon that, that haircut that day showing up that day. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, my energy is going there which was great. I did it for 20 years, but it was time to shift. And so I'm feeling, um, even though it's hard sometimes to be very vulnerable and share our story and share, uh, you know, sort of the heartbreak that goes along with understanding that your child has autism and then admitting that. Um, and then the judgment that you feel like you get from other people that maybe you're just not a good parent or, you know, that your child's just not uh, disciplined, which isn't true. So I'm just experiencing all of that at once. And so uh, I just want to share that with other people so that they feel like they have a place to go 
um, to start and to feel safe Mm -hmm. to reach out and learn more about what their child's dealing with. And also to not be afraid of it. I was terrified. Um, but you were, you were a mother already. So you already had raised two sons. Yeah. So you knew something was different. Can you, I can only imagine people who this is their only child and they're not quite sure is this normal? Is this not? So mm-hmm. that's, that's very um, good, good for you to be able to recognize that there's something different going on. Mm-hmm. And, and you're right. The social stigma If someone falls and breaks their arm, or if you've got a child in a wheelchair that's got CP or something else, some other type of disability, it's very obvious that there is a physical anomaly. But some of these more emotionally based anomalies that are physical in nature, but they're the child appears normal. There is a there is a a stigma that can be attributed to to the parents or to the child with that. Is that is that what you have found? I have, and, and honestly, experiencing Emma, uh, what I've noticed is that it's almost as if they have a hard time being inside their own skin. Okay. Um, and it's it's anxiety, it's uh, frustration that they can't express. And that could be lighting, it could be sound, it could be the clothes. It's very hard to find clothes that she can wear. Uh, potty training was an adventure and we're still constantly working on that but it's, it's everything. So yeah, when I had my boys and, you know, they're functional adults, they're great young men. I'm like, Oh, I did it right. You know, I figured it out. And then with Emma and her presenting so differently, you know, I, I find that to be, um, you know, sometimes it's really upsetting because you wish, you know, I see other children, I, I get triggered sometimes, um, you know, just seeing other children, her age experiencing, you know, Christmas and experiencing birthdays. And she just does not see that. And so there's a lot of stuff that she doesn't participate in and she can't do. And so there's a little bit of emotion and triggers, you know, when I see other kids, but then I just tell myself, you know, I do believe everything happens for a reason. This, this challenge was given to us for a reason. Um, And, and, you know, to be able to share that with people and be vulnerable, I think even if it could just help, you know, someone else go, wait wait a minute, maybe my child's on the spectrum and, and have them not be so afraid to reach out and get help. Um, and not taking it on ourselves as it's something that we did wrong. You know, it's, it, it, you know, that I did something wrong during my pregnancy, which I didn't, or, you know, when she was an infant, that something was done incorrectly. And so I I have to remind myself a lot of times too, that that's the situation. All of her milestones were being met as an infant and then, and then something changed. And I know that, you you know, that, that there may be, you've done some digging in that and there might be some opportunity for you to share privately some of what you have found, but what mm-hmm. you've done with this nonprofit is arranged to be able to help people navigate mm-hmm. when they start questioning. So, yeah. so tell us a little bit about what you envision this nonprofit because you're just getting started with it. So what do you envision this to be? So I really envision, um, I'm excited about going out and networking and meeting people because that's basically how we do that. You know, we've got, uh, we'll have a Facebook page, we'll have a, you know, Twitter or X and we'll have all of the social media um, to put information out. But again, we're kind of restricted to Colorado, but not in terms of um, identifying autism and, and different things like that. Sharing the information can be spread you know, everywhere. Um, so just really sharing information, wanting to figure out a way to build a community because I can go on Facebook and there's a lot of groups there, Mm -hmm. but if I missed a post and someone asked about a great doctor or, you know, I just was talking to Emma's therapist earlier about swimming. I have to, she has to learn how to swim. Um, autistic children are drawn to water and it's extremely dangerous. And so she has to learn how to swim. And I have no idea how to teach her. <laughs> so it's like, I need to do that, but just trying to gain, like, I'm just, that's something I'm trying to find access to right now. And then when I do, I'll add that to the website um, and I'll be able to send it out to people I know and get their feedback on maybe other resources that they used again, that I might not know, but with the website, it's, it's different than a Facebook that, you know, you'd have to dig through and read and look back. It's, it's a, it's a space where it stays, it's updated. I want to do um, some video. Um, I'm going to add that here shortly, but add some video content where I'm speaking to people about the experience, not just, you know, them reading about it. Um, 
Uh, I'm also going to do a blog and then ask other parents to do video footage on the website of their experiences, of their accomplishments, of, uh, you know, sort of their, their autism. Right. Um, things that work, things that help. Um, yep. I'm sure there are, there are secrets. That, um, I, I know my son had ADHD and it took me a while to understand why when he would come home from school, he would just shut down. He, could, he, he was brilliant, genius IQ, brilliant with it, taking tests, but he never did his homework. Mm -hmm. So he would, he had IEPs, he had all kinds of challenges, mostly because he wouldn't do his homework. What I found is many of these children who are hypersensitive to the environment around them, like you're talking about with your daughter, he was hypersensitive. He, he He's an empath. He could feel, sense, smell everything going on around him when he was at school. And by the time he came home, it was information overload. He just needed to shut down. And, yeah. and so therefore he never was able to complete his homework. It was, it was really a challenge as a pay, as a parent. I now look back and think, you know, he was struggling. This was hard for him. It was, and it was hard for me to try make him do the homework. And it wasn't until we got to some teachers who were very aware and understanding and could, this is what the IEP, the modification for different types of students, but there's, I'm sure there's so many different levels of, uh, you know, uh, of these, the different on the spectrum, as you say, and it, it just, it's helpful for parents to realize the different tools, the different opportunities that they have for, to, for support. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think too, like just with your sharing that experience, and your son wasn't able to say, well, I'm getting very triggered with the lighting in the room and, and mm -hmm. all of the people around me, I can't focus. Like, it's almost like they just, they, they like, they shut down. They don't know how to respond tonight mm -hmm. and they really don't know how to articulate what's wrong or what's going mm -hmm. on. Cause they don't really know. Uh, so I think, you know, teaching for one, I'm a big believer in like intuition and the gut and and all of that. So if Emma's in fight or flight all the time, right? you know, when we're in, that's why she's, I actually homeschool her. She's not in a public school. It's just because I don't think she would do well there. I don't feel like that's a good setting for her. She would be at a hundred mm -hmm. all day long. Mm -hmm. And so, and then usually once they have that, it's like a meltdown all day. Right. And if you've ever seen an autistic meltdown, there's no I mean, they'll harm themselves. Luckily, mm -hmm. Emma doesn't do that, but she can. Mm -hmm. She can hit herself when she gets frustrated. Um, so they can harm themselves or other people as they get older. Uh, it's There's so much that goes into it that you have no idea. And for example, um, in my room, I have a safety bed for Emma. I didn't even know they existed. And so the safety bed is so that all the way up to adolescence, she can be essentially safe. There's a zipper and a lock from the outside. So she can't escape because they, they escape, they'll, they call it, uh, is it, they just, they'll take off. And so with that at night, I have a, a camera in there. It's got uh, sensors in there and I'm able to keep her safe at night. Didn't know that existed. Someone told me at a park, you know, um, the other thing I'm really researching right now for Emma is, um, uh, a service animal and looking at getting her a dog mm. uh, that is actually trained to be her dog and is able to do things like if she goes that's the word elope if she goes to elope or if she goes to cross the street the dog can safely redirect or take her down so she doesn't run into the street or go to water um so essentially that dog is there to keep her safe mm. and um so i'm looking right now i'm just actively looking at trying to do that for her as well. So again, something I can turn around and share on the website. Um, just those little things that you never, that you never you figured know. you'd have to know. Yeah. I didn't, and I never connected to having the dog with um, people on the autism spectrum, but I have worked with clients who have had therapy dogs that were PTSD and the dog could sense if they were going into anxiety. And the dog would just lean on them. It was amazing to watch where the dog would just, you know, would get up from where he was laying, come over and lean on the patient or on the client because the dog sensed a change in the person. And it would the calm just by the way, by leaning, it would calm the person down. So the different therapy dogs are absolutely amazing 
truly is amazing. Yep. And that was something I just learned while building the website because a friend of mine whose daughter has autism, she has a dog for her daughter and she was telling me about it. Cause one of the things too, with, with Emma specifically, when I say she has severe autism, it means there's, they don't like the words right now, but there was like high functioning yes. is what they used to call Asperger's. They right. don't call it that anymore, but high functioning and then low functioning. I so see. Emma would be considered low functioning, I meaning see. at seven, she's probably operating more around age three. I see. Um, but she also has no stranger danger. She will go with anybody anywhere. If you're tall, you are there to get her something and she'll grab your hand and take off. And so I can't even explain like a public situation and the eyes that have to be on her. Right. Like I avoid a lot of things just because of the fear that she might take off. Or if I lost her for one second, she couldn't tell someone her name. Right. You know, so it's, it's, there's different things you can get for kids, but she won't wear uh, band-aids and things. She'll pick at them. So there's no way to put her name on her. Uh, mm-hmm. that someone could go, Oh, this is an autistic child. We'll do that. You know, um, or take it to, you know, an emergency person. So there's that being said, a dog would be great in that circumstance. Sure. Uh, because I think the other day I was driving and I saw a van and I had a sticker that said, uh, child is nonverbal, autistic, won't respond to commands just in case there was a car accident. And the yeah. child alone. And I, I never thought of that, yeah. you know, so it's, that's the kind of thing that I just want to be able to share with people, because I think a lot of, you know, a lot of tragedies can be avoided um, with just a deeper understanding of what's available and what to do. I have a question. Have you researched anything to do with equestrian therapy? Because yes. my sister runs in a, a therapeutic academy of riding in Tennessee and has amazing results. So um, uh, what have you experienced or what have you discovered? So I actually, that's one of the coolest things about the website. I have that featured as one of the um, options that you can have. Um, and, and I haven't looked into it yet for Emma, but her speech therapist mm-hmm. has a horse and a pony and a pig. And so <laughs> she's like, I'm going to, she was working on creating that for herself where she could do right. her therapy in conjunction with her horse. Right. Um, so I haven't done that yet with Emma, but I cannot wait to do it. Uh, so it's featured there. Different places are, uh, I guess you'd say certified through the state and therefore um, those are also provided, yeah. uh, you know, in terms of cost efficiency, or if, if not completely um, available to someone at no cost. Yes. So which is amazing. Right? My sister runs a nonprofit. So many of these acad- these therapeutic academies are nonprofit. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I love that. Uh, I can't wait to dive into that for Emma and just so she can experience it. Cause I think just the, the size of the animal and that energy that horses just have and like the calmness, I think you know, like I said, she's kind of constantly vibrating, um, and it, with anxiety. So just trying to get that to calm down when that happens, she understands things on a different level. She has a communication device. And so for example, she's so funny one day she just starts counting. So she knows her numbers. I didn't know that wow. she, um, and she, it, she pushes the iPad and it has a voice that speaks for her. And so she knows her colors, she knows her numbers, and she knows the alphabet. And I had no idea. So it's one of those things where it's also too going, how much does she have in her brain that I don't even know about? You know, that some of these kids just start talking at age 12, you know, and they say, I, I, you know, understood everything that was going on. And so I have no idea she could speak. She may never speak. Um, that's just, it's a little heartbreaking, but I don't know. So I just have to work toward other ways of her to be able to communicate. She doesn't resonate with sign. She'll do a, a few signs, but overall she, at this point, she doesn't resonate with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will teach her sign language as well. Sure. Wow. Yeah. So many things to learn. I mean, it really, yes. It just catapulted you down a whole different path. I know my son did, did for me as well. He also had, I didn't find this out until later in his high school years, he had gluten and dairy intolerances oh. that were, that he responded to that caused other sorts of act reactions. And had I known earlier, it might've made a big difference for him. Absolutely. That can trigger so much. And I know with Emma, she, when she was a baby, she ate everything. She 
would just stuff her face with all the foods. And then slowly that stopped and one item would drop off and the next food item would drop off. So at this point, this is another exciting and fun part <laughs> of having an autistic child, but she goes through sp- at times where she won't eat at all. Mm-hmm. So we're in a stint right now. It's been a month. Her last time was two months. And so we actually have nutritional drinks prescribed um, by the pediatrician that give her the nutrition that she needs because she won't eat. Mm-hmm. And so um, she's getting that provided to her, but she won't put food in her mouth. And at this point, not quite sure why they think it's sensory, but it comes and goes. Based, so yeah. it's that, that's just another thing too. I never saw that coming. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. um, you know, being able to provide information uh, to people about experiencing that as well is something really important to you. Cause that, that was just very scary. And I did not know what to do when she just stopped. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but there are options out there, uh, things I had no idea, obviously with these drinks that provide the nutrition. Sure. Sure. I know that I I've worked with clients before young children that have stopped eating for different reasons. Now they weren't nonverbal, but in working with them and you've done some session work with me, what, and I, this sounds, I'm sure this will sound a little uh, out there, but sometimes there could be a spirit around them that died from a, some sort of something that they ate. Mm -hmm. And so therefore all of a sudden the spirit is there, don't eat that, don't eat that. And so then once we release the spirit, then the child, (laughs) excuse me, is able to start eating again. So Mm -hmm. I've had a couple of situations that have been along that line where the child picked up a spirit from somewhere and we do, we pick them, we go to different places and the spirits are like a cold. We can pick them up. <laughs> and I have stories on that as well, but um, I've seen her communicate um, with yeah with people, with spirits before. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. Right. But one of the interesting things is that, so she does something called stimming. So for example, uh, this is one of her toys. So she doesn't play with toys appropriately. She, she does this all the time. So she's constantly stemming on things. So when I noticed one time, um, she even turned her head, like something was whispering to her and she was uncomfortable and she got upset. And I noticed right then she just got really upset. And I thought, oh my goodness, something's communicate with her, but, but I don't want communicating with her. And I did a few things instantly to sort of just say, I don't give permission right. um, for you to communicate. But when she was a baby, uh, my dad passed away. I've got videos. I, I know he was playing with her huh. and she knows, she knew his picture. She knows him and mm-hmm. never met him. And so I do believe that she interacts on a massive level um, huh. interacting with, with the spiritual side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're very aware. They're mm-hmm. you know, hypersensitive, although they can't communicate. There is yeah. an awareness because it's like they have a different developed sense. If they can't, their sense of speech is not as developed, but maybe their sense of intuitiveness or awareness is more developed. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And it's just about guiding that, right? Like, I mean, I think if we, I think if we do that with ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I was born in 79. So I'm sort of like this nineties, eighties, nineties child where it was like, you know, raised, fall down, get up, rub some dirt on it. You're fine. You know, move on and, and tough it out, (laughs) bootstrap sort of stuff. And I'm finding that, you know, I believe the statistic is one in five children will be on the spectrum by 2025. So when we're looking at dealing with people that don't respond the way that we used to learn and don't respond in the manner that everything used to be, we can either learn from that and like sort of move through it or resist it and resisting it. And it, for me, resisting it, putting Emma in a classroom makes no sense to her spirit, no sense to me at all. And, uh, you know, if, it, if it did, if she emerged into a certain place and that was something that would provide her a lot of benefit, Oh, I would do it in a heartbeat, but for right now, it's just not right for her. And being able to, to move through this, get paid to stay at home and take care of my child. Being a CNA has made a huge difference with the way I interact with doctors, with her caseworkers. It just, I'm more of a partner than I am a parent that's kind of 
doesn't know what's going on. And I'm, it, it makes me feel super active within her care. So yeah. I can't, I can't say enough things about being a CNA parent. Now, were you trained in as a CNA before or after this? So after this, I found out as soon as I found out that there were companies that pay you to stay at home, okay. um, the care provider doesn't have to be certified. Uh, so like my mom is not a CNA, she's a respite care provider. Um, but with me as a parent, I have to be certified. So I did that online four weeks, I think, took a state board test and I'm licensed CNA. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Good for you. Yeah. So people are gonna be finding you on your website. That's about to be launched. Yes. And that um, we'll put the website in the, you know, in the description, but what is, what is your new website called? So it's Colorado Special Needs Resource Center and our CSNRC is for short. Um, and so it, it's going to be launching either later today or first thing tomorrow. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and people will be able to access it and look through it. And it's, it's, sort of a work, it's going to always be um, updated. So as new information comes out or I meet new people that have information to share, that will be added. So anyone that has thoughts or ideas, I would love to hear them if they have experiences that I've not had. Uh, you know, even with like the service animals, somebody might reach out and say, hey, I know this and that. And it's extremely helpful. So just, um, you know, just really wanting to build that community um, right. for people that were in this position. People need the support. The mothers yes. need the support. Parents need the support. For 100%. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, Being a single parent to my children, my boys, is completely different than my daughter. It's night and day different. Um, autism adds a whole other layer to that already difficult situation. So, sure. Well, and it's good you've got your mother that's there. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I know you did some session work too. Was that helpful for you? That was beyond helpful. Uh, you know, I met someone that worked with you. I happened to cut and color her hair and her husband's hair. And she's just like, you know, she says, you need to have some work done. You just really need to have a clearing. And I said, okay, let's do it. You know, I'm, I'm open to it because I definitely felt, I felt as though something was keeping me back okay. and I knew I had to take this new venture on and I needed to have that energy okay. and really it's, it's hard sometimes to move through this because I'm experiencing it too. Um, and so it can be, you know, days where you just don't want to do anything or if Emma's having a really bad day, it's, she kind of dictates the day. Right. Um, so I, I felt like something was really holding me back. And so it was huge for me. Um, I think when I talked to you right after one of the first things I noticed was, oh my goodness, did the people who not were no longer needed in my life, they were just gone. It was, it was bizarre and it was fast and it was all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it was, it's, it's beautiful uh, to have that clearing mm -hmm. of unnecessary, not saying people aren't beneficial, but you know, you have those relationships where it's not serving either one. And it's just, I don't even know what it is. It's just kind of there. Um, it really helped me to just sort of remove the people and um, things in my life that I didn't need to have there. So uh, that was one of the first and most important things I noticed. Wonderful. Yeah. Oftentimes we get stuck in toxic relationships that are not serving us or them. You're right. And so therefore, as you clear, as you shift your energy, everything around you shifts. So that's, yeah. that's powerful. Yeah. It was a game changer. And I think, uh, you know, learning how to protect myself energetically. Uh, I do the protection in the morning and at night um, for both myself and my daughter and the people I love and just sort of protecting us from what it is we can't see, but you could most certainly feel it's happening around us right now. So um, it's just that protection is huge. It makes me feel a lot better about encounter going out and meeting people and, and encountering new people right. um, because I feel protected on that level. Wonderful. Good for you. Good for, yeah. Good for your daughter as well. Every yes. Day. So how can people find you on your new website? And they can send an email to Mary Ann yeah. at your new email is csnrc.org, right? .org. Yep. 
Yep. And then we'll have a link and contact us on the website where you can, it's got a text box where you can put in information or reach out. Cause right now it's my mom and I, um, that are doing the nonprofit. Eventually, obviously we, we plan to expand and have more team members, but for now it's just the two of us. Um, well, the three of us with Emma. And so, uh, that's how I can be reached at this point. If anybody has any questions or like I said, experiences that maybe I'm not aware of, or, mm-hmm that they can share with me too. So Absolutely. please reach out. That's wonderful. Is there any last thoughts that you'd like to share? I just really appreciate you inviting me on to do this. Uh, I have a tendency to just kind of sh- like close in mm-hmm. um, and I really need to get it out and start sharing. So mm-hmm. I appreciate the opportunity to do this. And then really just your gift of, of working and clearing uh, for me and know that it's changed a lot of things. It's uh, how I operate, how I interact with my children, um, how I show up to the world, I think. So I just really appreciate everything that you do because it's so, it's so unique Mm -hmm. and it's so needed. And I think people are are starting to awaken to that, the fact that, that this is out there and that it's something that we all need to do, I think on a regular basis. So I just appreciate being invited to share and, and sort of push to go, come out of your shell. Let's have a conversation. So I appreciate workers to be doing what we're all called to do. So each person has their own unique gifts, skills, and talents. And as you're called to do that, my, my gift is helping you to be the best you, you can be. So that's wonderful. I'm so glad that you're doing this. Many blessings for you and for Emma and your mom and for all those that you are touching through your, your efforts, your vision. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. So for everyone else, until next time, look up, stay positive, and be the light in someone's day.